So when I when I break in, I'll get you to turn on the the, the camera thing again. Oh, shut up. <laughs> I pressed the wrong button. That's it.
Hey everyone, we're about to go uh, live with audio and video, so um, nobody say the word wazoo. Nope. Um, <laughs> so as soon as uh, I get the thumbs up, um, we will we will go live, and then I might uh, ask uh, Magno for his help to uh, find the right slides to change over to a different slide. So um, the way this is going to work is. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the PSA slides to you and the greater audience. Then I will introduce Bill. He will talk for a bit. Then I will come back and do my presentation. And then um, when, when Magno's finished at the buffet, then he can talk. All right, so when I get the thumbs up, I'll start talking. Oh, I've been talking, have I? Yes, oh, okay. All right, so um, first of all, uh, welcome to our first return to a Canada meetup for OWASP Ottawa since COVID. Um, we're, uh, we're very, very uh, thankful for uh, Trend to provide the venue. And so um, we've been at Trend in the past pre-COVID. And so it's great to come, come back to uh, presenting in the Canada area in the new renovated um, trend offices. Um, earlier, we, we got a brief tour. Bill gave us a, a brief tour, and we were able to, you know, whenever you have a reno, you have to have the big reveal. So we had the big reveal. Um, so um, just briefly before I introduce Bill, I wanted to talk about a couple of things that are OWASP related. Um, first of all, um, that's the QR code to our chapter page. All of our information, our links to social media, our, our links to YouTube and things like that, as well as um, how, we, how we roll are on that page. Nobody will try to sell you Bitcoin from that QR code. Um, there are advantages to actually being a member of OWASP. Um, not only do you get uh, funky email and all those sorts of things, but you get, you get a number of perks. Um, there's a number of perks here. Um, this slide is always going to be changing and updating with resources and things like that. Um, and in case you're wondering, um, you, this will all be recorded on our YouTube channel. So if you want to save yourself some writer's cramp, then, then you can watch it later at your leisure. Um, we would like to hear your uh, security presentation. So if you have anything you want to talk about that's security related, if it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, if it's an hour, um, we want to hear your pitch. So this QR code, and this one e won't sell you Bitcoin either. This will go to our Sessionize page, which is a, you guessed it, software as a service thing that helps us organize meetups in terms of getting speakers and, and getting details like that. So please check it out. Um, in case you're wondering, whoa, that rendered weirdly. Um, these are our, our social and anti-social medias. Uh, we have the bird site on top. Um, we've been on Mastodon since the fall. Um, we have a Slack, which you can join, although I'm told that uh, Heroku was being a bit of a pain, so I have to go and check and see if that Heroku link does not, why it does not work, but it will be back, trust me. Uh, we're on LinkedIn, and we curate all of our presentations on our YouTube channel. Um, our Slack has a jobs channel. Um, the ED of OWASP has office hours, so if you want to check those out, um, he uh, does it a few times a week, and there's a Calendly link you can check out there. Um, there is, that's the... Um, Oh, main OWASP Slack. Ours was there first, so that's why we don't have a channel on their Slack. We just ended up being the initial adopter, and then they followed us, or something like that. So OWASP has their own Slack. Um, I'd like to thank any all the volunteers that help us uh, try to get our act together. Um, you, you know, in in our our approach is do what you can 
where you are with what you've got. So if you want to help us, please, um, then um, feel free, you know, reach out anything and anything and everything will help. Um, there are events. Um, Global AppSec in DC in 2023 and uh, GSOC 2023 ideas. I, I'm not that familiar with that one, so I have to look that one up. Um, projects, we've got some. Um, a number of uh, OWASP projects are uh, constantly being updated and here are some recent releases. Amass is one of my most favorite tools. You want to get creeped out by the internet, check out Amass. Um, Defect Dojo um, is another cool one where we, um, we've actually run that as a workshop before. Um, so that's a, that's a fun project. Juice Shop is, is always, always a fun project if you want to try a modern, vulnerable web application environment. Um, and uh, dependency check, which might come up in a talk shortly. You already, you're here, you already know this one. Um, again, thank you to Trend for our return to Canada. Um, it's with the support of organizations and individuals that help us with our educational outreach. So thanks to Bill, thanks for, you know, putting up with all our conversations on email over time. Um, but it was really Bill who reached out to, uh, to us when we were doing B-sides. Um, we also meet monthly downtown uh, at the University of Ottawa in the STEM building. All this information is on our, our meetups are on our uh, uh, meetup page. And I think that's it. So I'll stop gibbering on about that and I will pass the mic over to Bill. Um, and I will uh, ask for uh, Magno's help in him uh, switching the slides because um, honestly, I shouldn't be touching his computer anyways. Okay. Let's see. Thanks, Gary. I'm good. So I'm Test. Share here. Did you actually hold, hold the button? There we go. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you would just like to put this thing. Oh no. Okay. So the back the click the 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 is fine. It's it's just maybe just cradle the battery. Sure. Okay. You got it. Cool. Test. All right. We're online. Thanks everybody that's online. I have no idea how many are out there. Um, so this is a, a hybrid, obviously, experience. Uh, first for me, in terms of doing this from a, a home office or from, not a home office, sorry, from a, a trend office. I typically you know, talk in front of customers in their domain and what they do and learn about the customer first. Um, so a little bit about, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna use the clicker. Hopefully it's going the right way. Oh, there we go, perfect. Um, so who am I? Obviously post, um, thanks to, to Garth for coming in and, and, um, volunteering your time, obviously Magno, but a little bit about me, um, more than just what I do at trend, obviously I'm a, a territory manager, but, um, conversationalist, um, business enabler, community leader. I'm going to say a few words that are not on this, obviously football's European football, let's put that out there. Soccer, um, is part of my passion. Um, and because of that, I'm also uh, a chair to the Auto Carlton Soccer League. So I do some community work, some volunteer work. Uh, but I also believe that part of that innovative path, there has to be um, a security conversation. And, and I don't want to see that exempted as, as CEOs and, and planners and strategists uh, talk about innovation. Um, so a bit on the agenda, uh, of course. I have to put this up there, Magno and, and Logan. Magna Logan or Magna, sorry, Oliveira. Ol Oliveira? Yeah. Oliveira says the last name and Garth Boyd, uh, just on what they're going to discuss today. Um, but just a little bit about um, uh, some public announcements or some, some other announcements. Uh, Trend Micro is now a corporate sponsor. So we have actually uh, provided um, some funding in terms of uh, the foundation and obviously uh, focusing on the, the local chapters. And I think that's an important piece on what they're doing. 
Um, we also have uh, some workshops upcoming for, for the cloud one. So if you're interested in more and getting your hands dirty, um, locations are, are local. So uh, Calgary, Halifax, Montreal, and Ottawa. Um, so there are QR codes. Yeah, and they're not obviously malicious. They're definitely right to the site where you can register and, and look at more information. Um, uh, there's also the, uh, the, the, the Risk and Resil Resilience Tour. So we have a world tour that's happening right now. Started in Iceland. Uh, and what is it? It's basically a, um, a trip across the land as opposed to bringing customers uh, to our uh, perspective, which was uh, pre-COVID. We now are going to different uh, parts of the world to, to help discuss about you know, design, build awareness, some excitement about how to be resilient and how to address risk as, you, uh, as people grow, as businesses change. Um, you know, In-house in, in cybersecurity uh, subject matter experts will be there, some leaders, of course, uh, but a blend of local and, and uh, networking elements as part of that. And, of course, a partner, AWS, is part of that conversation, too. Um, so in terms of uh, who we are, what does Trend do? Um, so obviously, this is a, a picture of uh, probably close to 2,000 trenders uh, that are coming from different walks of life. So university grads, threat researchers, um, uh, cybersecurity experts, sales, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so definitely an important piece because what we do in the past obviously complements what we're trying to do today, but also what we're doing at Trend Micro. Um, so Trend Micro, we, we obviously spend a lot of time with non-for-profit organizations helping uh, with natural disasters across the globe. Uh, we're also uh, experts in, in terms of enhancing culture and diversity and inclusion. So we're trying to close that gap with regards to equality. Um, and of course, we're about education. I think we're a learning organization and we always champion that. Um, and we're also bringing in the best uh, of local universities and students. So. Uh, part of that is also an outreach program called um, um, Safety for Families and for Kids and Families. So there's actually a ISKF is, is uh, that acronym. Um, so what are we in terms of numbers? Uh, obviously, we've been profitable for the last uh, 96 quarters. Uh, if you do the math, that's pretty close to 25, 27 years or so. So it's been pretty successful. We've done a lot for many customers. Obviously, many customers, uh, you know, 400 and almost a half a million there, uh, but also across 175 countries. So we're global. Um, we also protect many assets, obviously, you know, to the to north of 62 million, uh, but we're number one in cloud security. So we're definitely not newbies in that space. Uh, leader in XDR, so extended detection and response. Uh, obviously a leader in endpoint protection, uh, but also we're, we're, we're part of uh, an IPS uh, next-gen market share as well. Uh, of course, uh, I mentioned a few of you, but there's also public disclosure uh, or public vulnerability disclosure, sorry, my apologies, um, where uh, we have a, an initiative called the Zero Day Initiative to help with uh, the bug bounty program and, and helping those that are, are obviously producing software and, and, and tools and technology. And of course, 75,000 employees strong, over 73 countries. Um, and we're obviously in many industries, uh, banking, of course, automotive, Telecom, petroleum. Sorry if I'm talking in and out. Hopefully it's okay online. We're good. And of course, healthcare. So there's a lot of um, a lot that we do for different industries. Um, so today focused, well, obviously is OWASP and and threat research. But I'm just going to give you a bit of why I, I want to talk about uh, software development because there's a lot of that in our backyard, sitting in the Canada Research Park, um, and what the role of security should play. Um, so I'm going to bring up, bring up uh, a bit of a talk from, from Mal Malcolm Gladwell. So I don't know if anybody's played a team sport before, uh, like soccer, basketball, any of that sort. Obviously, it's a team function. It's not individual play. Uh, and what I'm calling out in this regard, you can, you can actually scan that QR code. It goes to his talk on YouTube, is to talk about um, the strengthening the team or better looking at better ways of performance of that team. Um, uh, Malcolm cites some, some interesting concepts and paradigms about basketball versus soccer or, or European football. Uh, he identifies basketball where you only really need to focus on the two or three players and you can literally pull the extra fourth or fifth player off the street and you still have your, 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 your all-star team. 
But in, in soccer, it's more about team play, but identifying, I wouldn't say the weakest link, but the weakest decision being made. Um, soccer is more of that team element where everything's shared, but everything is, is important as a, you, you roll things out. And that's why I, I want to cite that is because security should be part of that equation. Um, so yeah, interesting talk. Talks about uh, uh, Gen Z and you know those digital natives that are coming to the fold. Obviously, we're bringing them on board as new talent. So I just thought I'd showcase that. Um, to get this clicker going. Um, so what is uh, what is CNAP and what is uh, what are the challenges it it, it solves? So um, you know, CNAP is you know, cloud native application platform. Um, obviously, a more secure software security is a continuous concern. So if it's shared, then it's obviously addressed easier. Uh, awareness of uh, security considerations uh, by stakeholders. So it's a, a challenge uh, that's obviously met and should be discussed at stakeholder level, not just obviously the end user. Um, early detection of flaws in the system. So the idea there for software development, less work, less stress, and um, and the, the streamline of, of what goes to production and gets better and quicker. So you, your bosses are happier because the features work sooner than later and then you're you're good to go to talk about the next iteration. Uh, cost reduction, because of that early detection and quicker time to resolve. Um, again, less work equals less cost. Um, overall reduction, overall reduction of intrinsic business risks for organization. So as things get faster and faster and you need to repetitively get quicker to produce those features, uh, you wanna reduce the risk, the possibility of risk for the organization. So in conclusion, you know, cloud security ecosystem is only as strong as its weakest point. So I'm taking that article from uh, Mike uh, Langford here uh, in terms of identifying, you know, the weakest point could be that weakest link, AKA going back to Malcolm Gladwell on his talk. Um, so just reference to that. Um, so in terms of security platform, uh, the idea there is obviously to reduce complexity. Uh, unify efforts, you know, integrating solutions and centralizing visibility and management, but simplifying and standardizing things as you talk security, uh, connected workflows, automation, uh, orchestration obviously is key. Uh, but, you know, have those functions part of each other, like soccer. So you're all together working for the same goal, not to score goals, but to keep possession of the ball. And that's what you want to do in this case. Um, and then uh, as a result, this is um, part of the Trend Micro One uh, approach to what we're doing for business. Um, you know, ranging from, again, end users to information control systems, OT, we got network, including 5G, uh, applications, code repos. So there's a lot of ways that adversaries are getting into architecture these days. And, uh, and we're, we're designing that, obviously, that tax service risk management piece to help with continuous discovery, but also assessing the risk and mitigating the risk so that you're not jeopardizing and you're not leaving things open. Um, and on the back end, there's a lot of services. So um, operations in terms of SOC, IT and cloud operate. So that, that piece is really focused on the, the CNAP part of it. And that's why uh, Gareth and, and Meg are here. Um, and the typical enterprise journey. So I'm just gonna give you a quick lay of the land, obviously in terms of what's happening typically in a lot of organizations in terms of uh, adopting cloud. So hybrid is usually the norm today. Um, you know, optimizing that and then automating uh, security is typically the, the conversation. Um, I'm just getting this clicker to move forward. There we go. Um, and then as we shift left to the software development side, so the, the cloud, so the microphone is kind of in and out. Okay. Um, native application development. So the idea there, there's a lot of technologies in software development. So containers, storage, open source, there's a lot of uh, ways to... Okay, all right. Okay, sounds good. All right. All right, actually, that sounds better. Good point, thanks. Um, yeah, open source security and then service to list. So there's a lot of um, cloud native application development that's happening in, in uh, the app. Uh, software development life cycle. So I just thought I'd uh, showcase that with regards to how uh, cloud security posture management is also key to that adoption. Um, and it doesn't matter where you start, sooner the better, um, because as you continue forward, security conversations become easier. Um, 
And then, yeah, again, the new approach, you want to talk about governance and the uh, cloud native application platform, not just silo technologies that don't talk to each other in terms of security. Uh, security challenges in the journey today. So yeah, again, siloed uh, security solutions, um, but also uh, separate security for compute, networking and storage. Uh, new tools. So obviously if one tool doesn't work today, you're looking for new tools. Um, separate to cloud native components, um, shifting ownership. So moving infrastructure and responsibility to de developers. And obviously the new approach to match the new environment. So uh, the challenges are obviously those conversations, but making sure it's, it's shared across the, um, the teams. So there's the, there's the reference to the two, two different personas, obviously developers and cloud teams. Uh, they want to do things faster. They want to reiterate, but also uh, they don't want to include tools they don't want to really support in terms of their work, uh, but also security operations, not specific to cloud, is probably high by cloud, uh, need to secure the business from, from the threats. So uh, what they don't know, what developers are doing, they, they need that visibility. So, so the idea there is with this going to the next slide. Some reason it's not working. Is Mango here? It's for some of you, it's stuck. Oh, there we go. I just use the, uh, the touchpad. Um, so I'm just using this as a use case in terms of the security team. Um, who here is from a security operations or security side of the business? Okay, cool. So you probably are familiar with uh, the conversations as companies change change up their, their resources and their development strategies. So um, typically project requirements, you know, conduct a detailed audit of an area of security tools, consolidate and connect, uh, give developers actual insights so it complements their work as opposed to just bringing value to the security teams but have sufficient insight to both runtime and dev risks, dev time risks, and how are they related and improve the overall security posture of, of their cloud environment. Um, so this typically is a, a use case, and I just thought I'd call this out because um, those projects should always include security, um, regardless of how fast the, the project needs to go. Um, and then uh, again, what is cloud native? Um, cloud native application protection platform. That's, so that's just a reiteration of how things are transforming. Uh, servers, obviously the standard VMs, going to containers and storage and serverless, but also using APIs and open source today. And, um, and the necessary guardrails that have to be in place in terms of cloud security posture management. And that's what speaks to uh, the need for cloud native application uh, platform, protection platform. So um, yeah, cloud one approach just to reiterate, I believe this is the last slide. Um, yeah, the right security, the right information, the right time. So, you know, rich in context in terms of intelligence uh, to the right people. So not only the, the dev teams, but security teams. So get that synergy going between the two uh, at the right time. So dev time, not only that, but in runtime, uh, but in the right place. So in the cloud, on the one console and obviously uh, complementing the, the developer environment. Um, you know, exciting automation, resilience, scale, transformation, innovation, visibility, and agility. Um, and then, so switch to uh, next up is Magno. Magno. So he's having another side conversation. You're next. No, I'm Sorry, Karen. Sorry. Sorry. My apologies. Mike, Magno's my other name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm the last one. Okay. Um, I'll just need to Magno, but I do need Magno to tell me where the other slide deck is. Yes. Yeah. Because the last time I touched, I shouldn't touch your laptop. No, it's okay. Right here. Cool. I'm able to talk from you. I don't know. It's it's a bit wonky. Maybe. So, it's not. so I think I crushed this bottom key. Oh, right. And that's right. what I think it just defaults to the touchpad. Oh, right. Okay. So, Cross finger. Yeah. I'm worried about the battery, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. So you need the finally the actual. Okay, this one. It's there. There we go. I need to share on on here first, and then 
Here we go. Uh, one second. Right there. Oh, yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so um, this is a quick talk that will, you know, OWASP has lots of projects, lots of top 10s. Well, it's really top 150, but they, they focus on 10 because, well, we're, we're busy people. Um, but with all those things, I don't think the time to go through every top 10 does any one of them justice. So I decided to focus on the three that keep me up at night. So um, I want to, uh, here's the gratuitous who am I slide. Um, I've been doing security for a while. Um, uh, currently I'm uh, contracting and that I'm also volunteer at OWASP Ottawa. So um, I want to talk briefly about OWASP, uh, the chapter, other Canadian chapters and those friends. And this graphic I have to put in every slide deck I do just because. So what about OWASP? So um, open web application security project, right? Wrong. It's now the open worldwide application security project. And why would that be? It's because it's more than web. There's mobile. There's so much going on that OWASP talks about that web just wasn't doing it justice anymore. So to be more accurate at uh, AppSec in Dublin, AppSec EU in Dublin recently, they changed it to worldwide. Get over it. Is it still working? Clean up in aisle four. Is it, is it coming up on that? Okay. Sorry about that. So it uh, started in uh, 2001 and in 2004 became a 501c3 nonprofit organization in the US. It is community led and with that brings benefits and other benefits. Um, there are 250 chapters worldwide with tens of thousands of members. So it is the world's largest nonprofit organization focused on software security. And that includes chapter meetups, educational publications, and uh, projects, as well as conferences. But what about Ottawa? So um, OWASP Ottawa was created as, I think we sort of figured, we sat around and talked and it was 2007-ish um with monthly meetups um it was started by sharif kosa um local serial entrepreneur um and we do monthly meetups workshops um we'll invent a better clicker there we go um outreach to the community um, we were online in uh, during uh, covid and now we're hybrid and so we're back to meeting, you know, friendly humans. And we have our own DJ just because that's how we roll. Um, the goal of our chapter is to be informal and approachable. Um, if you want to help, we'd love your help and we'd be very thankful for it. Um, and more particularly, we want to encourage and welcome beginners. If you're security curious, if you have an interest in learning and a desire to learn and an ability to learn, hop right on. We, and I'm going to read this one out because this one's important. <clears throat> we are open, tolerant, and inclusive organization that accepts all races, genders, creeds, abilities, things, and ideas with the exception of one. Hate. Hate has no home at OWASP Ottawa. So there are other chapters. Um, uh, chapters in Canada that uh, are active, such as Victoria, uh, Vancouver, Toronto, um, and I think Edmonton. Um, there have been chapters in other cities, but as you can imagine with a volunteer organization, sometimes that's hard to do because as we all know, life happens. 
um, other chapters have online presence as well because it's a big, brave world out there. Um, there'll be a lot of chapters that have uh, content on YouTube, such as we do. So you can literally go back years of our previous meetups that's curated by year and subject matter um, if you're interested in a particular topic. But um, yeah. I want to talk about what keeps me up at night. So um, when I was first thinking about that talk, this talk, there was things that sort of get my web goat, if you know what I mean. Um, and so um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, share with you a few of those, what I'll call friends. And the first one that really annoys me is vulnerable components. And not because it's hard, not because it's, you know, technically challenging, not because it's, you know, an incredibly horrible series of security incidents associated with it. It's all those things, but because it's so easy to solve. So we've probably seen XCD cartoons, and this is an old one. And it doesn't talk about security, but it's the same thing, trust me, where your entire architecture is built upon third-party components. And that one, I don't know if you can see, you know, maybe if you limbo down in the front row there, um, this one component that's been, um, that's so fundamental to the architecture, been uh, maintained by some random person in Nebraska who's been thankless, thanklessly maintaining it. It's security is the same thing, but it's actually worse. So how is it worse? Um, well, let's just talk about entomology. This, this is accurate in terms of the slide um, in that it is a, of the MITRE's common weakness enumerations, um, it is an unmaintained, potentially risky due to an unmaintained comp component, but it doesn't even begin to talk about the security issues of that component. Let's talk about who's heard of Log4j? Who's heard of the Log4j vulnerability? Well, we'll get into that one. Um, maybe struts, struts, third-party component vulnerabilities, remote code execution. So there's a number of issues that could be associated with third-party components, such as a malicious clone, a clicker that doesn't work, uh, very valid libraries, but with malicious content added that the maintainers didn't notice or valid libraries that just have flaws. So um, let's talk about Log4j, and this is a personal experience. And it's personal because I call it the Log4j party. So why was it a party? And it was a party because at that time I was working with a Fortune 75 that had international reach. And I know for a fact that everyone in this room will have used their products. That's how broad this organization is. And when Log4j hit, they had thousands of applications in play in their infrastructure. Um, some of them were built internally, some of them were built by external suppliers, but they had absolutely zero idea if they had Log4j running in their environment, and if they did, were they vulnerable? So imagine this, international, thousands and thousands of applications running in their infrastructure, and they had zero visibility about what their risk exposure was. So what happens? A Log4j party! So it is no exaggeration to say that they spent millions of dollars in people time to crawl through their entire application environment to understand whether they had Log4j, and if they did, were they vulnerable? Not to mention the fact or the loss of opportunity cost of all the projects that had to come to a complete standstill to answer the first question. So how do we defend ourselves against third-party software vulnerabilities? And the first one that I'll talk about is provenance. When you're developing and you're greenfielding a project and you're choosing third-party components to, to use in your project, 
do you know the providence of the provenance of those particular components? Do you know um, what is the history of that component? What is the number of users? Is it a highly used uh, component? Presumably, if it was used by a lot of people, somebody might notice something. Um, who are the contributors? How's that tracked? What's their history? Um, are there any reviews? And we're not talking Google reviews, but we're, you know, people talking about it, maybe on Reddit, maybe in other forums. Um, or are you've got the right name, you know? Has somebody typo squatted it? Have you fat fingered your way into a malicious library? Then we get into the more um, uh, meat and potatoes, sorry, vegetarians, of, of vulnerability checks. Are you um, in your build pipeline? Are you using tools such as, due to the other slide at the beginning, a WASP dependency check to check things in your pipeline? Are you using commercial dependency checkers you know, to see what's vulnerable in terms of the slate of third-party components? Or if it's open source, maybe scan the code. You have the code, you have access to the code. Maybe you can have a look at it. You know, in your pipeline, you could do some SAS testing on it. You could actually read the code. Um, and then once you've got that, you know, baseline of your third party component, you know, maintaining that golden image in a container repo somewhere. So you're, you're always pulling from a known good area. And maybe afterwards, you're continually scanning containers that you're developing in your pipeline. So um, at this point, you know, we've got something. We've checked its provenance. We know it's bona fide. It's got a good history. The street cred is good. We've scanned it. We've done all these things, right? We're safe, right? Or not. So the I I I miss the far side. I, I mean, I just it was like a, a modern metaphor to you know my modern lifestyle. Uh, so the metaphor here is you know we have when and and I'm not sure if uh, you can see the bottom, but the caption at the bottom is when potato salad goes bad. So you've got your potato salad. Maybe that's your third party component, and you made your potato salad and you put it in the fridge. It's perfect, right? It's delicious. It's wholesome, it's, it's delicious, right? And you go back three weeks later, is it still good? Maybe, maybe not. So how do we know when you've done your scanning of your third-party components, you've looked at the code, everything's good, how do you know if there's not a new finding, a new vulnerability, a new CVE against it? So how do you defend against this? Well, there's this um, something called a software bill of materials. And so um, if you've got something in production, um, how do you, it tries to answer the question, how do you know if that software has a new vulnerability that, that you were unaware of at build time? Um, or what about your downstream clients? They're using your software. They're packaging your software or maybe you're white labeling it. They're using your software. How do they know that your software is invulnerable? So you use a software bill of materials. So what does that give you? So um, first of all, what is it? Um, an SBOM is literally just a standardized schema of, of data on your third party components. Um, and there's a number of tools, both free and commercial, that will be able to generate it in your pipeline. So you're building something, at the end of the day, it coughs up a standard schema SBOM with all the components um, that, uh, all the components, their versions that you can monitor. So in, once you have this, you can then monitor it in real time. Um, and it's not like you have to read YAML or JSON or anything like that. There are tools that will work with that SBOM and continually, uh, continually alert you. Such as, here is one um, open source, uh, yet another OWASP project. So any questions about friend one? 
He's a good friend. He's always there when you don't need him. Okay, insecure design. So in um, top 10, number four from the 2021 um, OWASP top 10 um, is my friend, uh, insecure design, which is different from insecure implementation. Um, and the thing about this is that you can, um, you can have a secure design, you've gone through all the steps, but you can fat finger it. You can have an insecure implementation, a misconfiguration. Things happen. That's understood. The thing is, is that insecure design cannot be fixed by perfect code. So I'll personal experience in the past working with a team or a company, um, a new feature had gone out into a SaaS product. Um, it came as a surprise to the security team, which tells you that there was no testing, there was no discussion in design, there was absolutely no security access to it. Um, the problem was in that particular case, um, there was no way we could um, patch it up. There was no way we could have a workaround. The architectural flaw was so insipid that they had to pull the entire feature at an extreme cost to the business. So, and the fundamental problem was, is in the design phase, there was a lack of consideration for malicious use case. Now, they had good customers who were great people, and maybe they thought the MVD, M, MVP happy path was for everyone. But because they did not consider malicious use cases, they had a design that left them wide open to something that they could not fix with a more secure implementation. And so I always pull this up. This is actually related to just general bugs in the software development lifecycle with an axis of vertical axis of cost versus time. And so the cost to remediate an issue later in the development cycle is much, much worse uh, or much, much more expensive. So in this particular, in my particular case, they were in production. So they were, you know, off this and probably down the wall here somewhere. So the cost to pull the feature, redesign and, and start over was extremely costly. And that's why consideration of security pushing left, as it were, is a much better option on the left side of the scale. So um, the good news out of this entire thing, after crossing the Rubicon, this team became one of the best teams in the organization in terms of security and engagement. So um, I think I've already talked about these things. So the solution here, the defense is a secure development life cycle. We talk about security and user stories. We um, do a risk analysis. We develop a risk register. How risky is this data, what is it exposed? Maybe we involve Mozilla's rapid risk assessment just to get an idea of how risky this data is. Um, we gasp threat model um, where we can, um, I think I pressed the wrong button now. So we decompose the architecture, we do data flow diagrams. Um, we, no, I'm still. We build a threat analysis table of threats and controls. Any questions about um, friend two? All right, friend three, server side request forger. Oh, sorry, there was a question. So the, the short story is threat modeling is easy. The problem is, is that there is so much um, literature around it that makes it look huge 
that it scares people. But if you have a workflow in your agile environment, it can actually be very, very powerful. Um, if you're already whiteboarding things, there's your data flow diagram. If you know what data is traveling, then you just need to mark it on that same diagram. And then if you then just itemize the flow, you have a table. And then you, once you've got your table, then you can say, how can I break this? Now, I know we've all been developing. We've always been on that yellow brick road of MVP happy path. Everybody's a well-behaved user. And so because developers, I believe, and this is just me theorizing, is that they've, we've focused our education on always the happy path. We haven't developed cynical people. I'm very cynical. And so I'm like that snooker player that's seeing, you know, you do this now, three shots later, you're toast. And maybe that's just the way my brain works, or maybe that was just the way I was trained. You know, maybe having Scottish parents helps. I don't know. But the, it, it helps seeing a lot of fail. Yes, I, I can't deny that. The idea is, is that we do things like this to share fail in a happy, fun environment. Um, but the, the point is, is that um, you will save so much future fail if you think about fail early on. Understanding the attacks um, is, definitely helps. Um, you'll say that pen testers, you know, it helps being a developer having development experience to be a pen tester because you know where the pain points are. You know where, where the jugular is, right? Um, because you know the pressures teams are under. In the same fashion, um, having somebody with a no knowledge of attacks during the threat modeling process because they know where the pain points will be is, is very helpful. The challenge is is to share that knowledge against a development team so they are as cynical as i am does that answer your question sorry i don't mean to depress you hmm. yeah maybe i'll copyright that phrase i'll be on the gravy train for life okay any other questions server-side request forgery I love it because it's a 20 year old new sensation. Uh, maybe it's because they got a better name. I don't know. It was first brought out by this guy by the name of Daryl Highland in 2008 at a conference called ShmooCon. Who's heard of ShmooCon? I, I, I love the name, honestly. You know, we should, you know, have something in Ottawa that's, is, you know, you know, something like that. What would we call it? You know, something like that. Wazukan, or I don't know. Anyway, so um, he had the very catchy name of web portals, gateway to information, or a hole in our perimeter defenses. At a beat, at the word baby, it's a hit, right? So maybe SSRF makes more sense. There's a YouTube video. I haven't looked at it lately, at least since I built the slides, so it should still be there. So um, the unique thing about this particular attack is, is that its own category within the OWASP TAP-10. Um, they've been trying to curate and have an entomology going. Um, but it, this stands alone, and that should say something to you. And it's been responsible for several major breaches, for, uh, such as the Capital One, or what I call Capital One Customer Zero breach. So, um, you know, it's an attack, obviously. It attacks an application, a web application. Um, but what's insipid about this is, is that it tricks the application into making requests on your behalf. Um, and so because the application you're attacking has a trust relationship with its own infrastructure, I mean, if you can't trust your own app, who can you trust, right? Um, it hijacks that relationship. 
So um, it's got a bunch of other names, such as uh, cross-site port attack, out-of-band resource load. I, 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 for some of these names, I think I need a two-drink minimum. Um, what else? Um, it's got some associates, such as, uh, remember XML? Anyone? One of, you blotted it out of your mind, right? You know, you. It's like let's take it up XMO behind the bar. Anyways, so um, improper restriction of rendered UI layers of frames or CWE ten twenty one. That's another catchy phrase. Um, it's got some affiliations. Confused deputy, and I think this is probably the closest one um, where you're you're hijacking the app, it's your deputy now. Um, and um, it, it actually receives, in this case, uh, content from upstream components. Um, and in this case, it does not preserve the original source. So um, in this particular case, so the app is receiving your payload. Um, and what it's doing is it's taking that payload and it's actually forwarding it to the other downstream components that trust it. So there are a number of serious impacts. Um, I've used it to enumerate content or services on the back end. Um, it has been used to execute commands um, in the context of the running app. Um, it can be then used and leveraged to attack other, if you've enumerated other instances um, on the back end, now you can leverage attacks against them. These are services that would not have direct access to the internet. So I'm using this attack to access a internet facing component who issues commands on my behalf to attack things that everybody thinks is never visible on the internet. And it's not limited to HTTP based attacks. Um, where this becomes really hard or really insipid in the Capital One case, is attacking cloud-based metadata APIs. So um, in the Capital One case, um, the exposure was 100 million Americans and 6 million Canadians had their data exposed. And that included names, addresses, phone numbers, incomes, credit cards, payment histories, and social security numbers and social insurance numbers. The complete dossier of you. And it all came around because a WAF was misconfigured and that enabled them to now use SSRF to talk to the AWS metadata service and gain privileges because when you talk to the metadata service, you, that's how entities with cloud entities get their identity. So now suddenly you have an identity in the customer's infrastructure and that gave you privileged access to services and components. So in SSRF's natural habitat, there are three conditions you need to exercise. First, the injection, your payload. So we leverage another OWASP top 10. The software is somehow vulnerable to an injection attack. What I call the fumble. The service receiving your input, your payload, now starts reissuing requests with that content. Um, in, if you check out Orange Size uh, Black Hat USA 2017, he has an example of that. And then there is the response. And that's the return of whatever that operation was to you. That also would include, um, in the opposite case, would be a blind SSRF, where you have to use tools like 
expert collaborator to be able to see if anything's happening, um, if that server is not returning data to you, but still reaching out. So how do you defend against this? Input validation. Input, if you want to do one thing, just one thing, do input validation. It protects you from a great many sins. Um, suddenly your system is making DNS calls to things that are outside the scope of what your application is supposed to do. Um, so maybe checking and validating what DNS queries are being made. A stateful firewall never hurts. Um, is it making requests that are in an acceptable list? Um, network segmentation. Is A allowed to talk to B, who is allowed to talk to C or not? And in this particular case, AWS updated their metadata service to version 2. It's 2.0, it's got to work. And well, monitoring, what is going on? Why is our cookie recipe site suddenly, you know, making Twitter calls? And I hate to break this to you, static code analysis always helps. Um, in terms of the updates to AWS's metadata service, um, they, they, their, their privileges were limited in scope, was one change, um, and based it on user session-oriented requests. And that's it. Three friends. Thank you. And at the cue of applause, I'll pass it on to Magno. You use this at your peril. I know, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, with the mic, maybe I'll need this. There's two buttons, one on the top. Yeah. So that's on? Yeah. That's on. There's one on the side of this. Now that's on. The blue light is on. Okay. Are you sure that's on? Yeah. That's fine. If not, you got this. This we know kind of works. Yeah, because I'm going to need my both hands. Okay. Can you hear them? You can hear? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear here? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, great. This. Welcome everyone. So this is going to be more hands-on. If you want to follow along, feel free. Uh, all the stuff, all the repos are there and it's public, but I think I need to share here, right? Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. Oh, okay, let me just me her the display. One second. Displays. Oops. Can you still see you there? Okay. Okay. 
Can everyone hear and see okay, all good? Okay, perfect. So yeah, uh, today I'm gonna talk about GitHub Actions and in a way that we're gonna try to build a DevSecOps pipeline in one hour with GitHub Actions. Um, basically, GitHub Actions is a way to kind of automate your CI CD pipeline and you can do all sorts of things. You can build your application, you can uh, run some testing, uh, you can run security testing, all sorts of things. So think of as a way to replace Jenkins or whatever you use for your CI, Circle CI, whatever view you have there. And I think we have someone from GitHub here. So he can correct me if I say something wrong. Um, sorry? Okay, perfect. So this is the project that I have. Um, this is what we're gonna build, right? So this is the end goal. Uh, and basically, uh, it's just the YAML files for the workflows with three types of tools, right? So I know it's not a complete DevSecOps pipeline or however you wanna call it, but we're gonna add the three main AppSec tools that you should have on your pipeline when you're testing your application. So SCA, which is software composition analysis, right? So looking for your libraries, your dependencies, checking for vulnerabilities, checking if they're outdated, checking if there are any licensing issues. This is what an SCA tool does, right? So today we're gonna use Sneak and I can also showcase the Benda bot so everybody's happy. Um, and, and yeah, so basically looking at the dependencies there. We're also gonna talk about SAST, right? Static application security testing, which looks at your custom code, the code created and, and written by your developers. And it looks for vulnerabilities there. Um, and today we're gonna use Sonic Cloud, which is from Sonic Cube. Uh, but there are other options as well. We can also try to uh, also add some code QL uh, or same grab, however you wanna try it. So there is different options. The way is that with GitHub Actions, there are uh, actions already built in by these companies and these providers. And all you need to do is just plug it in on your uh, project, on your repo. And the last one that we're gonna add is DAS, Dynamic Application Security Testing, uh, where we're gonna do with uh, SAP, which is a, also an OWASP project there. And it basically scans, it sends a bunch of requests to your application to try to look for vulnerabilities there. So it's gonna map based on the HTTP uh, response and response codes if there are if there is a vulnerability such as like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and things like that. And so these are kind of plugins, right? So the ones that I'm using today, like you can you can change if they are available, right? Uh, already uh, on the GitHub Actions Marketplace, you can change and you can try other things. So let me show you the marketplace here. So if you think. Uh, if you played with Jenkins before, you know, there are plugins and, and things like that. It's not exactly the same, but actions have a marketplace. And so you can look for different uh, 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 actions that are already made and you don't need to, you know, reinvent the wheel. So there are many categories of actions today. You can see that there are 18,000 and going up every time I do, like I talk about GitHub actions, this number goes up by a lot. And anyone today can uh, publish their actions here. So in the marketplace, if you write something you want to publish here, you can look it up and, and other people can use it. Uh, I also have my own uh, security research that I did around GitHub Actions where I, I work on uh, like what would happen if a malicious action is deployed to the marketplace and someone starts using that as well. That's a separate topic. But if you want to learn more, uh, just let me know. Uh, you, can, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or even on GitHub as well. So for security uh, automation, there is a category here for security. And if I filter that out of the 18,000, it's about 900 and something actions that are already available for us. 
So there are probably tools that you use on your uh, on your pipeline for uh, scanning your applications today that might have uh, an action already made. So all you need to do is basically uh, import the workflow or, or copy the YAML code into your repository and start working, start using. So there is a bunch of things here. Of course, I can't. I'm not going to be able to cover everything. So let me. Before I start doing stuff, let's let's go over the workflow that we have here on this repo. So the, the repo is github.com slash magnologan slash gha for GitHub Actions dash devsecops. There's only one thing here, which is the workflow file, basically. So this is my YAML file. That's how GitHub Actions work, and I'll zoom in a bit. Uh, so let's try to understand what is happening here. So the name, of course, uh, the name of my pipeline, I can choose whatever name I want. Um, and then there is a directive there on, right? On, it's, it's going to tell me which event will trigger this action. So I have many different events that are available. You can check the, the action documentation there. But there is on uh, pull request, on push. Uh, workflow dispatch, many other things. So there are events that happens to your repo, and if any of these events happen that are listed here, the action will start running. It will trigger, right? And in this specific scenario, I'm only triggering this action on pull requests. So anytime I receive a PR on these branches, so I can be very specific on the branches that I, I don't want to run my actions on feature branches or hot patches or whatever. I just want to do that on the master and main. Right, which is usually the the main branch is like the, the production one, right? The one that I have, I'm probably going to deploy to production. Any questions so far around this? Okay. So inside my uh, my pipeline or my workflow, I can have like each action will will trigger, will start a runner, and basically a runner is a server, a VM, that runs on Azure, since GitHub now is owned by Microsoft, um, and it will run my all my automation there. It's not a container, it's a VM. So we'll talk more about that later. So here I have uh, jobs. Each job is a set of steps that can be like scripts or even other actions. So my action, can call another action, which can call another action. You see a problem here? We'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, the first job that I have here, it's called Sonar Cloud, which is going to be my uh, my SAST right, job. And uh, I have this directive here because I had it as an example when I was teaching or probably doing a talk. This directive needs, it means that this job needs to wait for a previous job to run and complete before this one starts. But there is no recon job, as far as I know here. Yeah, there's no recon job that I created afterward. So this is not going to work. I need to remove it. Oh, we'll talk about it. Uh, this directive runs on. So GitHub Actions today is free for any user. If, of course, there are limits well, of how many hours and how many servers you can have running at the same time. but uh, the runners or the servers provided to you by GitHub are available on Linux, which is Ubuntu, uh, Mac OS, and Windows. So you have all, all three flavors of operating systems. Um, and this one, Ubuntu Latest, is the latest version of, of the VM available for GitHub Action, which is the VM that has, has the GitHub Action application installed. You can see what's installed already by default on this VM. There is a documentation there. I might not be able to find the website here right now, but I'll, I'll share with you later. So if you look it up, there is it's probably a GitHub a repo with all the software that comes installed by default. So things like Python, Java, Docker, Kubernetes, right? So you don't need to install them when you start. It's already there. But that means also that you're trusting all that software to run your automation and, and the end result of your it can be your binary, your Docker image. 
So if it's not affected, so you're, you're can be like a, a supply chain issue, right? So that's that. Uh, with the steps, right? So steps are going to be, it can be like a command, a script, or even another action. And the first step that I have here, right? It's the actions slash checkout at V2. So what that means? That means that if I go, the code for this action is available for me. It's a public repo on GitHub. So if I go to github.com slash actions slash checkout, I'm going to see what is running there. What, what, what is it doing? And basically, this is an action provided by the GitHub team because it's basically downloading the code from my repo inside my runner. Is that correct? Good. <laughs> Uh, and, and the version at P2 is just, just a version of the, of the action, right? So you can have different versions, it's just like uh, uh, tags or, or, or you know, software versions. Um, you can also specify that by, I think, the commit hash or the long hash, because sometimes even if like, there is a possibility of someone changing the action code but not changing the version, so there are some security issues around that as well. Uh, this is the, just kind of some parameters why, why I'm calling the action that, uh, slash checkout. I'm, I'm telling that that just can download the, just the depth of the code that's downloaded. Second step is actual my sonar cloud scan. So I had to download my application code that was on a GitHub repo inside the runner and then of course start the scanning that code and that's the sonar cloud one which luckily they have a third party action already available right and it's using sonar source slash sonar cloud github something uh, and i specify two parameters here so environment variables there is github token and there is sonar token the github token is already provided to for you you don't need to add or, or any, uh, do anything with that, but it allows, it might give permissions inside that runner on your repo. I believe that before it was read and write permissions, and if I'm not mistaken, it changed to read only by default now. Um, and the Sonar token is going to be the token that you're going to publish your SAS results to Sonar Cloud. So you're going to get a token once you set up that on a Sonar Cloud, and we're going to do that. Then you get a token, and you need to set it up here. So on the repository of the application that you're using, you can uh, add this token here so that you don't have anything hard-coded, right? Because if someone gets access to your repo, they can look at this workflows. It's, it's not like obfuscated or anything, and they're going to be able to see that credential or that token, right? That's not a good idea. So this is what we're going to do with SAS. Um, with the second one, the SCA with Sneak, similar approach runs on Ubuntu latest. I added here that it needed needs Sonar Cloud, but that's not really uh, necessary. It was just so that we can see because the way that I'm going to run the actions, it's, it's either going to run on parallel or sequentially, like one after the other. Same thing with the steps, running action checkout master, and then I'm calling the Sneak action and i'm scanning this one is scanning a node application so it's, it's looking at the libraries and dependencies of a node one so we can we can change this uh there's options there so if i go to github.com slash sneak slash actions you're gonna see different folders there for each uh package manager or language that sneak supports is scanning for uh library dependencies or, or dependency vulnerabilities sorry and there is also a sneak token that I need. Just okay, go up. So there is also a sneak token that I need, which will publish my results to the sneak dashboard, and I can see it there uh, uh, all the results. So I don't need to just look at the logs or the console output. And with this command here, it's, I'm telling sneak with the monitor uh, uh, parameter. I'm telling sneak now every time that this repo changes, run the scan again. Right? If something like a file, anything changes, right, run the scan again, check it again. So it's always checking that there and it's providing the latest uh, results on the sneak uh, dashboard. 
And the last one, which is the Zap scan, similar approach runs on Ubuntu. I, I added the needs one, but I'll, I'll change it because this is just the kind of the skeleton of our workflow. We're going to run that on a kind of a, a vulnerable application repository and we're going to create that YAML file there. Uh, similar thing, sneaks the uh, checkout. Technically, I wouldn't need the checkout because I'm running a DAS scan, so I don't need the code of the application itself because I'm not, I'm not building that from scratch, right? With DAS, you need the application running on a development or QA or production environment to run your DAS scans. And here also, that's the action for Zap, which is going to trigger all the, it's like a, it's going to run as a container and it's going to trigger all the requests to make sure to identify vulnerabilities on your running application. Okay, how do I know all that? It's all in the marketplace. All that stuff, everything here, I, I, I didn't create this from scratch, I didn't do anything here. All I did was put this together, right? So I only combined this code together from three different actions that are on the marketplace. That's all, that's all I did. Um, if I open another tab, does it start sharing? No, okay. So no problem, we'll work, we'll, we'll work on this one. I'm gonna go to, um, so I'm going to use the uh, node, yeah, node.js group. Let me just reduce that a little bit. And I think this one actually, we just delete this and we'll do it we we'll do it from scratch so you don't that i'm not cheating or or, or i haven't pre-made anything besides the the yaml code that we're going to use so because i think this one has already some workflows yeah it's there so i'm going to delete this repo and it's fine and we're going to start from scratch yeah yeah it's fine okay github makes it really hard for you to delete something Fine, it's good. No JS. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have to FA. Now it's mandatory, so good. Okay, one second. Yep. Eighty-nine. Okay. Oh yeah, it's loading. Don't complain about security. No, security right? Media. Exactly, right? Yeah. There's no such thing as too much security. Okay, since I've, I've deleted this repo, now I'm going to, uh, I have another tab, but I'll fork it again. So let me just refresh. And I shouldn't have anything there. One second. For, for the folks online, I'll, I'll switch back to the other tab. Okay. Okay, let's see. So this is a vulnerable application created on purpose by Sneak, and, and they allowed me to use on my demos and, and trainings and stuff. So that's what I'm using, it's, and it's also public. So uh, this is what I'm using as a vulnerable Node.js application. It's like, a, I think it's a to-do list, right? It's just, yeah, you can run it if you want. There are some other labs that I have where like, uh, after we run the SCA, we find a, a vulnerable library, we exploit the vulnerability, through the library and then we fix it, right? So there are other things that you can do here as well. But now this one has the folder workflows and I'm gonna delete all that stuff so that we start from scratch. So uh, delete directory, yeah. Okay. Okay, so all your workflows have to be inside your repository inside the folder called dot github and then inside another folder called workflows with an s if you don't add the s it's not gonna work believe me i had this problem i was struggling with it like why it's not working like okay yeah just an s so just write a set. yeah i uh, no, i haven't so but i don't think it's gonna work so let's do that workflow so if you want to uh also follow along if you want to fork uh, for the folks that are online as well, all you need to do is fork this Node.js goof, and then basically we're going to create the YAML file here step by step. 
workflows. Let me make sure that I got it right. And then uh, the files inside the, that the workflows have to be with the extension dot yaml dot yml or yaml uh, for them to run your action, right? Otherwise, it's not going to work. Uh, let's see. Tests. So, okay. Let's let's commit to May. And I know some. If you there are any developers here, we shouldn't commit to May. I know that, but it's just it's just for training purposes, right? Okay. So now I have the YAML file, and I'm gonna start changing. I'm gonna start adding step by step the stuff that I just showed you on the other repo. I'm gonna start moving things around here so that we start with adding the uh, SAS and SCA and, uh, and DAS as well. Any questions so far? Okay, good. Just some more. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Sorry? You can create a YML file in the workflow. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, it did run. So you try to run test and yeah, it broke because there is no, the syntax is not valid, right? So yeah, that's true. Good, good check. Good eye. Good catch. Yeah. Go ahead. My question here is like currently we are doing application, and it's all good because we are on cloud. But what if we are on prem and the runner is not? At the same time, because we will decide to call the runner's file from the cloud. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. Like, are you talking about self-hosted runners or? So here. Like in GitHub Actions, usually, yeah. like when we generate the flow, yeah. the runner uh, fetch all the data from the cloud, GitHub cloud. Yeah, from, from GitHub.com, right. yeah, yeah. But if my repository is on-prem. Okay, oh. So you're using GitHub like enterprise? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, mm. yeah. It, it, it will still uh, connect to the marketplace online. GitHub connects to the website every yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the workflow ran and it's broken, but it's fine. So we're gonna go back to the file. And now I have I'll have my cheat sheet here, right? GitHub.com. Just so that we can not make mistakes or any typos or anything. So I'll have that here on my side. And okay. So the file can be named anything here, really. You just need to have the extension YML or YAML. And it's nice because when I edit the file directly on GitHub, directly on my browser, I can do that. And it always doing uh it's it's already doing some syntax for my YAML, right? Because if you if you worked with YAML before, you know it can be a pain any indentation issues and, and things like that. So it's going to help me with that as well. Um, so let's see. I think I'm going to start with sneak because it's, I think it's faster. And I'm going to do things this way. So I'm going to do OWASP, Arwa, and micro. Otherwise, I don't get a bonus next year um, uh, on push. And I'll remove all the branches. And then I'll add the jobs. So, and sneak one. Sneak. And I'm going to do it like this. So no, this one's not there. Let's see. OK. Do you think this is going to work? Why? You don't have a token. Good. Yeah. Let's let's see. Let's see. So okay, all set here. Start commit. Commit to main. So here on the actions tab of my repo, I can actually like I was showing that before, but you can see that it's already starting the sneak job, and it's you, if you see there, oh. Job is waiting for a hosted runner to come online. So I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there are VMs already available, runners already like idle, available for you to just like be assigned. 
because you can see it runs so fast. And in the beginning, I thought like, of course, I should read the documentation before, but I didn't. So I thought it was containers. Like, okay, this is too fast, but it wasn't, right? So like, okay, you can run containers inside your runners, inside your your VMs, your servers there. Like like this one is running a container, um, but it's actually a, a VM, an Azure virtual machine. So yeah, it broke, it didn't work. Yeah, require an authenticator account. So you need a token. So let's see what we can do here. And I'll, what can I, I think I can share just the browser window so that if I switch tabs, let me see, let me go to the stream yard again. Uh, one second. Because otherwise I'll be switching back and forth and that's gonna be a pain. This one. Okay, let's see. Let's see if that works. Is that working? If I switch tabs. Okay. Oh, okay. No problem. So we just open the sneak yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna log into Sneak. You can create a free account. It's free for open source projects. And I, I have an account connected to my GitHub um, uh, account already. And basically, there's a problem here. With the fully free account from Sneak, if you create today, I, I think they changed something that you don't get access to the uh, API tokens anymore. So the token that I'm going to generate to showcase that to you right now, it might not work on your end because my account has some uh, premium features and all that stuff because I've worked with Sneak before and I was a Sneak ambassador. So I kind of have some premium features there, but, but it's okay. Um, yeah, it, it should work, and I'll, I'll show with the also with the Panda bot and, and how you can see the results there as well. So, um, yeah, and if you want to copy the tokens, fine. I, I like I use this only for testing, so it doesn't matter. Um, okay, are we are we good with the tabs? Okay. So here on the settings, I believe it's in service accounts. Yeah. So I'm gonna do OASP Ottawa. Go admin, create. Okay, this is my sneak token, right? So if I go there to the, actually this one, if I go to the settings of this uh, project, this repo, I have it here on secrets and variables on the settings, security tab or security uh, part here, actions. And this is where I can set up secrets so that I call that with the collection secrets dot the name of the secret and it's not hard coded into the YAML code. So new repository secret and it's this one needs to be the exact name that I'm using on my YAML code, right? So the one that I'm using and I'm going to showcase this one is uh, sneak underline token all caps. So I need to create exactly like that. Otherwise it won't work sneak underline token and, and if you if you're able to memorize this code you can use it right now for testing purposes but i'll i'll, I'll remove it later or yeah yeah it's fine like as long as please don't remove my account completely that's fine um but yeah so now that we added the token we can do it two ways we can make a change that makes the action because we are running on push. Any changes to the repo will trigger the action again, or we can just come to the actions tab and then rerun the workflow, right? Doesn't matter. All, all, everything is gonna do this. I believe it's the same, but I'll, I'll just change it here so we can see it. So, yeah. Uh, in my curl 2022, okay, that's it. That's all I need. Any changes, anything that pushes anything to the repo, go trigger that again. And you might see, should show up soon. Here, no, I'll go back there. Okay. So, yeah, every time you see this yellowish orange like button there, it means that, okay, it's, it's running. So, it's starting and it's looking for a, a VM, a runner to be assigned to start running. And it's already running. 
so you can see that it's it's pulling the the sneak right action here uh, no this is the sneak node yeah this is the first step um and then the checkout master right downloading the code into the into the runner and then running the actions sneak node master so checking for uh, um vulnerabilities on my libraries inside that repo and if you don't know exactly how an sca2 works most of them most of them will do like this they will look at your dependency file so you're for node it's package.json or package lock.json right so here is where you uh, where you have all your dependencies so you see the name there of the name of the library and their version right so basically what is Nick's doing and other CSCA tools, most of them do like this. They check this library in this version. Okay, do we have any vulnerability for this library in this version in my database, right? They, sh they should have a vulnerability database. It can be NVD or it can be their own proprietary or, or public database. Oh, they check. Okay, there is no vulnerability for this library. Okay, great. Is this library the latest one? Is the latest version? I'm using the latest version of this library. No, you're not using uh, uh, 0 0.4.9, right? You should patch it, but there is no vulnerability. So we can debate more about that, but that's fine. So it's going to go on each one of these and, and verify, validate for that. That's what an SCA2 does. Um, there are uh, um, other approaches. Some of them, they, they do it on the binary, and uh, other ones are also looking into, um, how can I say, reachability. So they're, all, they're also looking into if not just if you're using the version and, and the library and the version specifically, but also like if you're calling the vulnerable code. Because if I'm using the library and there is a vulnerability in that library, but I'm not actually calling that vulnerable code from my application code. Technically, I'm not vulnerable. So yeah, I should still fix it because if another developer comes and start using that vulnerable code, I'm in a bad situation. But right, it's not at the same priority as using the code that's vulnerable. Okay. So that's basically what Sneak is going to do. So let's go back there to the action. Oh, it's done. It's completed. So we can see that screen. So it means it's good. It's all completed here and we should see we can look at the console output here of the logs because after this job is completed i don't have access to the vm anymore right it's done i don't have access so uh everything that the runner produces uh any logs any artifacts anything i have to upload to github before i finish my job otherwise it's lost right uh and and yeah I, I would have to look at here at the console output but i can also look at stick because since we use the token and now the results are also there on the sneak dashboard so if we look it up if we go to projects i should have something here from today i think that's the one and you can see a lot of other people committed here as well uh, yeah, three minutes ago. So this is the the results of the sneak uh, scan with the GitHub action, right? Looking at the package.json, my dependencies there. And of course, there are a lot of vulnerabilities because this is a vulnerable application on purpose. And, and then yeah, yeah, finding the vulnerabilities is not the hard part. It's it's you actually the easy part. Fixing those that's going to be the problem. That's the challenge of the SCA. Because then if you don't like, let's say, oh, yeah, you have a fixed, you have a, a, a vulnerable version here. And the fixed version is this one. This, sorry, let me just zoom in a little bit. Okay. This one, right? There is a fix. Great. So should I just update it to the latest version to this one? What's going to happen? Oh, break, right? You potentially break the application, right? If it's a breaking change. This one, it's a minor change. It might not be, it might be okay, but there are ones that are changing the version 
by the major or minor version, that could be a breaking change. And it could break, break your application. And especially if you don't have uh, proper and automated regression testing, it's going to be a pain to find where, what, what, what the issue was. So you're probably going to have to roll it back and, and figure it out. So this is just one of the issues of fixing vulnerabilities here. So there's a, a lot more with SCA. I have some other talks around SCA online on YouTube as well, if you want to just uh, take a look more into that. OK, so now our uh, vulnerable application, our node application, has SCA running. Every time I change something on this repo, SCA will scan and it will provide uh, the uh, output and the results to GitHub. So we added one, OK? We still have two more to go. So just please bear with me. So now I'm going to do that again with Sonar Cloud. So we'll do the SaaS one. Sonar Cloud can be a bit tricky, but I think that's OK. So OK, here. See the ammo, how it can be tricky. Okay, actions, that's fine. Sonar Cloud Scan. And of course, it's not going to work because I don't have the Sonar token down there because I need a token. The GitHub token is fine. I don't need to add that to the secret uh, collections there. It's done by, by GitHub themselves. So thank you, GitHub. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so let me commit that. And we can see some errors uh, showing up on your actions on our uh, workflow. I'm going to see something starting really soon, hopefully. Yeah, see? And now you can see that these are in parallel. One is uh, uh, on top of the other, the sneak and the sonar cloud. Because I removed the needs directive, right? If I added the needs, the one, one would be after the other. So technically, if I need a job, a process, or, or action to like the Output of my previous action will be the input of the next one. Then I can use the needs directive as well, right? This for this one, no problem. The sneak uh, job will, will work fine because we already set it up, but the Sonar Cloud one didn't work. And it's basically, uh, see, set the Sonar token environment variable. So similar approach, I'm going to log in on sonarcloud.io. I can create a free account. Uh, you can link with your GitHub project. And you should be good to go. And basically, to get the token here, and, and it's a bit trickier, trickier with Sonar Cloud because it's not just the token that I need. I need something else that I'm going to show you. Uh, let's see if I don't just, I don't have anything. Oh, I have this one. Let me remove it. So we'll do from scratch. Okay. So of course I don't have time to explain everything about Sonar Cloud, but basically I'm going to create a new project, right? Analyze a new project. Uh, since I connected Sonar Cloud with my GitHub, it's going to show me all my repos that I want to add there, and I have a bunch of repos. Um, but I'm doing this manually so that we can understand uh, how how Sonar Cloud works and all the, the settings, the, the necessary settings that we need. Because I could just click here and select the Node.js and it would basically do almost everything for me. So that's not the goal here. We want to learn. We want to understand what's happening. And with Sonar Cloud, uh, basically, you need two things. You need the project name and you need the organization name, which the organization is your user, just like on GitHub. So this one, and I'll add the uh, project key and display name, the same name as my uh, application repository. So node.js-goof, and can be the same here. Uh, public, that's fine. So now it's asking us to select which analysis, which type of tool or CI, CD tool we're, we're going to use. And we're using GitHub Actions, so we can select that. And now I have a token, right? It tells me there the name, so our token we already knew from our workflows, and that's the value of my token. So this one, I believe it should work for you if you create your own account right now, uh, because there's no ret restrictions on the free accounts. Um, so yeah, let's add the token here. Same thing, settings, 
security secrets and variables actions new repository secret and now it's sonar underline token oops underline oh, why? That's not what okay got it and then the value here and you can see that i have both tokens and i can't see the value of these tokens anymore of course i i have it here on on sonar cloud but if I move around there, I won't access anymore. I can only update or delete it. So I can't see the value. So if I forget, if I don't have that stored anywhere, I would have to issue a new one and, and just update it or remove that one. See, I can't, I can't see it. I just go back so it doesn't exchange it, but I can't see the value. So it's, it's, it's pro kind of, yeah, protected there. So it should be good. Uh, so let's run the... Uh, since these changes that I added, just creating a secret, is, uh, doesn't change the repo, so it doesn't trigger an action again. So I have to change something on the actual repo files to trigger the push. So I'm just going to do, do it like this so that we can see it. Just needs, I'm going to add the needs here, and we can see how it changes uh, on the interface there. Needs sneak. It's still not going to work because I'm missing one file from the uh, from the Sonar Cloud uh, action. And let's see. See how that's different now? The interface there it's, oops, sorry. it's too bright. So yeah. Should see. So yeah, the sneak one is running and the Sonar Cloud one won't start until after the sneak one finishes right because they're dependent on one of the one another one another um so here on while they're running and, and we can go back there so we don't lose a lot of time um here i can uh specify on sonar cloud how do i build my project how what is the kind of the way that i build if it's java if it's javascript.net things like that so since it's a node it's JavaScript, and that gives me already the uh, uh, YAML file that I just need to copy and paste there. Uh, we already have it because I got it from the, the marketplace, but it's very similar. And there is something else. This is what's missing. The, the Sonar Cloud requires you to add a properties file, right? the sonar-project.properties, which specifies the project key and the organization name. Because they're going to use that to grab the results from the actions and then post that to Sonar Cloud, to the portal, right, to the dashboard. And then after each scan, you can create a history of how many vulnerabilities were found on each scan. And you can have like a, a, a map and a dashboard and everything, like pretty things to show your manager, basically. Uh, and that's all it needs. All the stuff here is comments, so you should be fine. So the name of the file is important again, right? And it has to be in the root of your repo. So let me see, it's still running, but it's probably not gonna work, I believe, because it doesn't have the properties. So yeah, it broke. Let's see that it broke. Oh, sorry. See, it didn't work. Um, so yeah, we don't have this file here. So I'm going to just add a file, create new file, sonar, dash, uh, let me see it again, dash project dot properties. That's all I need, the project name and the organization. And since I'm adding a new file, what's going to happen? It's going to trigger the action again, right? Because it's on push. So this will, we sh should solve our problem. And hopefully, the, um, the Sonar Cloud scan, the SaaS scan, will run and will present the results for us. And we'll also, oops, we'll also showcase some, uh, some results here on the session. Can you get in the feedback? Is that it? Okay. Yeah, we should see the results here on the Sonar Cloud and, uh, and also on the Actions dashboard. Okay. I'm not going to wait until it runs. I'll, I'll go back to that. So basically, let's do the last one because I know we're almost out of time.
but we'll come back to see it and I'll showcase here. With the DAS one, so um, let me show you the marketplace again. And that's basically what I got these from Actions OWASP Zap. Um, and you can see here that some of these actions they have kind of a blue check mark, just like Twitter. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if that's better <laughs> because it's it's verifying the creator uh, or the organization, but it's as far as I know, it's not doing any security check. So it's just verifying that the company or the person there. Uh, so of course, it's a bit more reliable than the ones that don't have a check mark, but there's still there is no verification, there is no uh, um, liability around security, right? It's it's not checking for security, it's not checking if it, if it's uh, a malicious GitHub action, or if it's a suspicious one, or whatever, right? Uh, and for Zap, the three main ones that we have that are developed by the user Zap Proxy, which is the user from, from the uh, OWASP Zap project, is the API scan, the full scan, and the baseline scan, right? So baseline would be uh, quicker, it would be simpler, it won't catch a lot of things. And of course, we're doing a DAS scan without authentication. So when you do a DAS scan, especially if it's an authenticated application, right? When you log in and you access all the features, probably the tool will, will provide, will find more results, will find more vulnerabilities. But for demo purposes here, I'm gonna use the baseline without any authentication, even be, because I don't, in this case, I'm not building the, the Node.js goof tool, so I'm just gonna scan something else. So that, just that we can see it, right? The target will be different. So basically the workflow file that I have here, right, the dust sap scan, it's it's the same uh same as this one, the advanced one, right? I can use this the basic one, so I don't need to change a lot of things. That's even easier for me. Uh so let's go back there. Oh yeah, they show the API one first. Uh yeah, there's the here. I have to go to the API one. So API scan, yeah, they show it here. So yeah, it triggers the different one. Right, I'm just wondering if it needs a spider dog. Da, 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 da. I don't see it here as a requirement. Yeah, okay. So our Sonar Cloud finished and it finished like completely successfully as far as it's, we can see here. And so just before we move on to the DAS one, let's take a look. And you can see here the results on the main branch because Sonar Cloud is still thinking that uh, the main branch is the master one. They haven't, maybe haven't updated yet, but you can see the results of the scan. Um, it didn't find any vulnerabilities. And I think there is an issue here with Sonar Cloud with the, either the actions or the rules. It should have found something, but it's just a matter of, you know, tuning and configuring that, but the scan is running, right? We have that on the pipeline, so it should work. It's just not displaying the results. Okay. Now for the last one. So we're gonna do the same thing. Come here on the workflow and add this, I just need the zap. Oh, I have the, only the steps. Okay. That and runs on the latest. And let me see this. Perfect. Move the latest and I'll remove these needs here so we don't waste a lot of time and they can run together. And you can see that the target here, this is my development or, or QA uh, uh, application, right? It can be a URL or it can be a, a P address. This one, they, they by default, they on the example here, they, they scan the Zap proxy, right? The, their own website. But you can also use something like Juice Shop, right? We can use the Juice Shop uh, demo app. This one. Uh, who here has heard of Juice Shop before? 
okay you people so you shop is another uh, uh vulnerable application developed by uh pro provided by oas developed by a guy named that I, 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 I probably shouldn't pronounce yeah bjorn kimnich yeah okay that's his name yeah, yeah he's from germany yeah, yeah. So it's basically it works as an e-commerce website that you can buy juice. That's why the name Juice Shop, and you can technically add things to your cart, add a fake credit card, add a fake address, and really complete the purchase. Of course, you're not never gonna get the juice, but but it works. Everything works here, right? So, and it's nice because it has many different languages, and also the. This is one of the challenges, but I'll show you anyways, that the, it has like a, a ranking of the challenges. So uh, has like six stars. So challenges with one star should be easy. Challenges with six stars should be harder. And you can also filter by uh, the category of the challenges. So if I just want to do uh, XXS, so I select all the levels and then, okay, show me all the XXX xss files uh, xss challenges if i want to do injection then i show this one right so i can filter here for the challenges that i would like to try but since this is the demo online version i wouldn't recommend using that because also other people are using and you can see some of the challenges have been solved already there is a way to run it as a docker image on your own machine which is it's much much better but i don't have time to show that today uh, so I'm just going to get the URL of the juice shop to use it as my target. And I hope the, uh, the guys at the juice shop don't get mad at me. Um, but yeah, I've done it many times. So, well, I think I should do that first. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, with the zap, it's a simple one because we don't have any, we don't need any tokens. We don't need, we're not doing any authentication right now. All I need is, is specifying the zap. Uh, action, which is the action baseline, and then the target, the URL of my application. This would be like the IP address or the URL of my development or, or uh, QA environment or even production if, I, if, I, if I'm feeling, uh, uh, um, I don't know, yeah, I, if I'm feeling that doing that on a Friday afternoon or whatever. Okay. So all the steps, all the tools should run together now. So we have it, we have the SCA with Sneak, we also have the SaaS with Sonar Cloud, and we have the DAS with SAP, right? And we did that in, I think, under one hour, right? So since you have all these tools, all these plugins, all these things already uh, made for you, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So it, it's if you're using GitHub, uh, or GitHub Enterprise or the online GitHub, the free version, you can do that today. All the stuff, the only thing that you can't do today is the sneak one with the token, but I'm sure there are ways around it. And also while this is running, let me show you some other security features that are available for open source projects from, from GitHub. And, and I'm, I'm not being paid uh, by anything by GitHub, okay? Um, so you can get the alerts from the Pendabot. So the Pendabot is the SCA tool provided by GitHub. It was from a company that they acquired uh, years ago. Um, and basically you can generate, if you enable here all the stuff, there is a dependency graph, which basically creates a, a graph of your dependencies. So as, as I was showing on the uh, package.json file, you saw there was a list of dependencies. These are the direct dependencies, right? These are the ones that are my project is calling directly, but these dependencies call another dependencies, which call another dependency, right? So this is like a graph. It can be very, very complicated really fast. Um, so we call them transient or indirect dependencies. And so that's what this graph does. And with the Pendabot, uh, you can enable different things. You have the alerts, you have the security updates, and you have the version updates. So the alerts will, will showcase uh, on the Dependabot uh, basically dashboard. And uh, the security updates, Dependabot will trigger a pull request to patch your uh, library, right? Uh, Sneak also does that. I don't want to be like, uh, I'm saying that one, one does and the other doesn't. 
And there's also the version updates, right? So if you just have an outdated version of your library and you just want to patch it, if you think that could be a problem in the future, then, then yeah, you can do that. And depend on what, we'll send you an automated pull request and you all you need to do is, okay, accept, merge, and that's it. Of course, there is some testing involved, some, some regression testing that you need to validate if your application is still working after that. So it, it might seem simple, but the, the aftermath might be tricky. So I'll just enable the depend about alerts, and I think that should be enough. But uh, yeah, if you, let's 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 do everything. Okay. Um, so now it's already showing. See, already uh, 88 issues. Maybe there's more. 126, 121, and so if you want, if you're feeling like if you have time available you can do both you can try sneak and you can try then depend about and you can compare those right so you can see which one are, are reporting more vulnerabilities but also uh more relevant vulnerabilities because more is not always better it doesn't mean that it's it's going to be like oh yeah this one's reporting more right because it's going to be probably more work for you so you don't want that so yeah yeah um so yeah that's that's the tricky part okay so this is Dependabot, and you can look it up for the, uh, the dependencies, the vulnerability. And here, since uh, I have the security update, so this is the, the bot that is going to show and generate the pull request for me. So I have pull requests coming already. See all the dependencies. And, and as I said, Sneak does the same. Um, not sure if it's automated or you have to specify, but yeah, it's not very different. So yeah, okay, just updating. And basically, if you look at the pull request, the files change it, right? It's what? The two files that have my dependencies, package lock and package up JSON. And, and see, that's the version changing. That's it, right? Just, just that. That's all they're doing. So that when you build your application again, instead of pulling the older or vulnerable version, it's going to pull the new one. That's, that's all. Uh, let's see if our, okay, zap didn't work. Oh, I see. Why zap didn't work? Research that accessible by integration. Okay, that's, hmm, I see. I think I know what it is because it did work. The results of the scans are here on the output console, but the way that uh, zap publishes the results, it creates an issue on my repository and inside that issue it publishes all that these results so since my repo doesn't have the issues tab enabled that's why i think it didn't work it's not saying that right now uh, i'm getting a different error but we'll, we'll see so i can go to the settings oops and enable issues i just need to click on this checkbox issues is there now and i just need to run it again and this time i'm just gonna run uh Oh, other stuff the dependent pods doing uh, okay this time I'm only, I'm only going to run the zap uh, workflow so we don't we don't waste a lot of time rerun jobs I can run all the jobs or rerun failed ones so only the failed ones so that's the zap I can have enable debug logging if I, I'm still debugging what's going on but I think what I know what the issue is and we'll see so yeah the other ones were completed already and, and we're just running zap so now we'll pray for the demo gods because we're almost at the end and hopefully it should be okay. Any questions around that? And yeah, go ahead. Uh, should you for instance, the developer So every time you push the GitHub, yeah, that's the build and stuff. Let's say you work with a big application that takes like five minutes to build. Mm -hmm. You have another mission problem. So on the developer side, the feedback loop would be pretty long. How do you think that you work with those five words? See if it's going to run in your computer before you run it You mean like validating the YAML file before yeah. running? Yeah. Do you run it on your computer before you know, you know it works and then say you have not doing it? I don't think you can because you need the, the runners, right? The actual VMs that are running on Azure to run it to test. So uh, I think the best you can do is. Checking the YAML file on GitHub because GitHub has, has this verification when you're changing the YAML files. 
and it's going to tell you if your syntax is wrong, if your indentation is wrong, it's going to break it. But yeah, I don't. Is there any way to do that? Okay, so yeah, my zap's still not working. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll get the full version here and let's try one more time before we wrap up. Otherwise, yeah, I'll, I'll check it out later, see what's going on. But yeah, we basically, we implemented three different security tools, AppSec tools that you can have on your pipeline with GitHub Actions in less than one hour, of course. You need some prior knowledge to understand these tools, understand the integrations. I, I did that because I've done it many times already. But yeah, you can do that, right? It might take a little bit longer, but it's possible. So yeah, the three main, I call it the triad of AppSec, SCA, SAS, and DAS. You should have these tools, at least these three, on your pipeline. If you're checking for uh, vulnerabilities in your source code, in your dependencies, and also in the running application. Any questions around that? Okay, sneaks running. Oh, the sneaks depending on Zap. Okay, Zap is running. That should be good. But yeah, the repo is open source. Uh, you can fork it, whatever. Uh, if you have any questions around that, if you're trying to do it on your own, or, or if you're watching the recording, uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and yeah, hopefully if it works, but if it doesn't, whatever. We, that's what I have for today. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let me stop sharing. You What's your mic? Uh, I think I was using this one. So um, thank you very much. Um, we have a regular meetup next week at uh, University of Ottawa where you know, if you have any questions, you want to volunteer, you want to teach a talk, uh, reach out on one of the links on one of the slides. The recording will be up sometime today um and thanks for coming out um last few years was last few words from my side so it's been nice to say i'm still planning to do this on a quarterly basis so um in terms of security in terms of software development software development there's a lot going on in canada this year but so i'm having those c-suite ceo conversations but I'm, you know security should be part of the conversation in software development a big unique it should not be that big space in kind of programs. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do here is the education piece. But if there's new and emerging technologies that you know we can help protect or we can help offer them, so 
cut security caution there as an example, team of security. We have two very good people here that obviously know their stuff. Um, but I wanted to continue the conversation. So I'm, I'm looking at also the weekend, of course, in summer. I know it's vacation period, but um, I'll put out a bit of a survey on what the thoughts are, what you want to see, and I would like. We can do a barbecue outside. Yeah. Okay. Barbecue, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.